All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Neeraj, I come from New Delhi, India. So the talk today is the joy of creating code art with code, which is basically creating code uh, art using libraries like Processing, PyCairo, maybe if you're a beginner, you can use Turtle. Or uh, if you are not a Python developer, if you're a JavaScript developer, you can use other frameworks. If you're a C++ developer, you can use Open Frameworks, Cinder, and all. So today we're gonna focus on Python. So I'm Neeraj, that's my Twitter handle, at the rate NeerajP99, you can follow me there. And let's start. So the agenda for today is, I'm gonna start with what is generative art. I'm gonna show you about, like, take you along with a long short journey about the history of generative art. Then we can talk about the factors which can contribute to making a good generative art. And then we can like discuss about a few examples on generative art and all. Okay, so how many of you have heard this term generative art, computational art, or computer art before? Anyone? Right, so so anything, any art which in which computer plays a role in production is a computer art, right? So how is generative art different from that? So generative art is more like a modern art painting or something like that, which use heavy use of geometric uh, abstractions and randomness. So if I have to like give you a absolute definition for that, it can be an artwork which is created by using of an autonomous body or an autonomous system. So you might be wondering what is an autonomous system here? So in generative art, an autonomous system is the uh, is like in this context is generally a non-human that is creating something for you while you're getting some inputs. Uh, you can like I'll just give you an example for a better understanding. Say you want to have a milkshake or you want to have a smoothie. So what you do is like you just use the blender, put some bananas or the other fruits, and like give like start in the, the blender works for you. What if you have to manually do that? It's gonna be hard, it's gonna be difficult, but if you give just instructions, it's gonna be very smooth, easy, and it's gonna be better. So this is how autonomous systems work. And okay, so these are the three factors, or uh, the three components which are used in making a generative art. So the first thing is randomness. So anything which is being made by mere randomly is, is a random art. So if there is no randomness, the art is not a generative art, it's more like a digital art. The second thing is geometry. So most of the generative art uses geometry, linear algebra, and trigonometry. So we use mathematical concepts to create these beautiful and complex art forms. And the third thing is algorithms, and most of the designers and artists use these algorithms to create these awesome artworks. The example can be uh, Mandelbrot set, which is like a fractal art. So we're gonna discuss all these features in the next few slides. So first thing is like the maths, the algebra, the geometry. So there is an image, and this art is made of like 14,000 circles. So as you can see, the trigonometric functions, the sine and the cosine here, plays a vital role in creating this art form. So, and I believe that these functions play the most important role when you ever create a generative art or any kind of mathematical art. And here, the, the, you can see the equation, if you want to like, if I want to give you a brief info about this, it's like the value of k goes from one to one, two, three, till, 14,000, because they're like 14,000 circles, and the kth circle is x of k, uh, comma y of k, and the radius will be r, the, the r of k here. So we can say that the artists have been fascinated by geometry 
as long as all these mathematicians have, because this is not me saying, this is like the studies have been saying this, and this has been reflected on the architecture of Rome to Florence. And if you talk about algorithms, this is the Mendelbrot fractal. So what is it? It's a fractal art, which means it's been created repeating, like repeat over the process of looping over again and again. So in, this, in mathematics, this process is often uh, an application of mathematical function, which is called quadratic polynomials. So it's more like you're iterating over again and again. If you zoom in, you will get the same, uh, same this thing, same art over and over and over and over. It's not gonna end unless you make the computer stop it. So, okay, so they are two things. So when making a generative art, some aspects of the artwork is controlled by the person, or the person is the artist or the human being who is like making the artwork. And you can say the artist is controlling the randomness and the order by which the artwork will be produced. So there are two things which will like generally modify these strategies. One is you don't know anything, which means that you don't know what the output will be, but you know what the input will be. So let's take an example. Suppose you have five different shapes, like circle, triangle, square, and everything. You know there are five shapes, and you want to make an art. Uh, you want to place 40 different, like uh, 40 shapes, which are like in five, which are the five of them are unique. But you don't know what the color will be, what the size will be. So that is what your computer is gonna do. The second thing you already know the end result which means like, you know, there are 40 different shapes and the sizes will be this, the color will be this, and only the randomness will create, change the final results. So these are the two main strategies that helps you creating a generative art. So let's talk a little about the history, then we can go on like discussing about processing, how processing works, and we can like discuss few examples in processing. So this is a painting plotter by Friedenich in 1967. So during those times, the analog painting were being created by humans, like it used to have, which is being humiliated by hands. And those paintings require a lot of time and efforts. So in 1967, Friedenich created this, but the other problem was like during those times, there was a lack of output devices. You don't used to have these like screens just to like, you just write some code and you'll get the output. So they used to have the plotter. So plotter is like a mechanical device in which it has a mechanical pen and the mechanical pen is being controlled by the instructions you put on inside the computer. So the other painting is Scotter by George Nice. And this is one of the, uh, like the earliest and the best known generative art of all time. So what is, George doing is this is like he took 12 squares, put them uh, alongside, and he used to change the magnitude and rotation as soon as he go through the rows. And you might be wondering like, why should I want to like use a computer for this? I can just manually make it by hands. So generative art means, suppose you want to, you have, instead of like 400 squares, you have 4 million squares. So it will be very difficult, like not impossible, but it will be inefficient for the human being to draw that with the hands. And the same thing can be drawn by a computer in like a couple of seconds or less than that. Uh, the third painting is All Days by Vera Molnar. So she's a French artist and she's one of the pioneer in generative art, women pioneer in generative art. So one thing is like she has made a lot of contributions to the, this field and she along with a lot of other women in spite of like having so much of backdrop because at those time women were not ha they don't used to have uh, those this much of freedom and a lack of what do you call it uh, they don't used to have much contact with the computers in spite of that they came up with these generative art and have made a lot of contribution to this field. The fourth painting is Florada by John Maida. So things change after this. 
So John Maida is a very famous personality in the field of generative art. He was a professor at MIT Media Labs, and he was the president of the Rhodes School of Design. So he has created a lot of these awesome artworks, like this floral painting and all. But he used to have two students. One is Casey Ray, and the other guy is Ben Fry. So those, both of them took a course called Design by Numbers at MIT Media Labs and eventually made a platform where you can even share and write your code and learn, make interactive stuff, and which is free, basically, which is open source, and which is now we call it like processing. So processing was made by Jen, uh, Casey Ray and Ben Fry about 18 years ago, and it's like one of the oldest and the best platform for creating generative art. So the process began as an open source programming language, which was specifically for Java language. Now it has been made for a lot of languages, including Python. So in, later in this talk, we're going to see a lot of examples on processing and how you can use processing to create different art forms. And the last thing I'm going to talk about in the history part is like <clears throat> people are now using generative uh, artificial intelligence to create generative art mostly using GAN, Generative Adversarial Networks, which is like you have two neural networks. One is the generator and the other is the discriminator. So the generator creates the image or the portrait, the, what do you call it, like a picture of abstract painting, and the discriminator will tell you the difference between both of them, if it's real or fake. So example is like, suppose you have two images, one is a, landscape which has a zebra and the other has the same landscape with a horse. So using this GANs, we can like change swap the images in real time. So the question is when is an art be called as a generative art? Because you're creating art every single day, but when is it generative? <clears throat> Say I have a small square. This is a small black square. It's like anyone can draw it. This is not generative art. Maybe like I made some additions into it. I make like five different squares. Do you think this is generative art? No. What if I like randomly give instructions to the C or the computer and make something like this? Now this is something like a generative art. This looks more like a QR code, but this is just random stuff. So if you want to see the code, it's, I think it's visible to all, no? Uh, okay, so the, the, that's a little problem. So I'll just explain you. So what we are doing here is like, okay, let's come back to this later. Let's see the second example first. I have a square again, and I'm doing again the same thing. I'm placing five squares. So this is again not a generative art. What if I do something like this? This is similar to the George painting, the Scotter. We saw in the beginning, and as we progress, we are like changing the magnitude and change, adding some rotations to it. That's it. This is how generative art is made, and this mainly took me like ten lines of code. So, before going further, let's talk a little bit about processing. So, I think it's not visible to anyone. So, in processing, we have two main functions. One is called setup, and one is called draw. So the setup is a function which runs just once when your program runs. And draw is the second function which will work until you give some instruction to stop. It's going to run over and over again. So there are some basic functions which you can use in processing and which will help you further. Even though it's not visible to you, I'll just speak. So there is one function called size, which is used when you give the instruction that I want a canvas size to be like this. So it takes two parameters, or maybe, uh, yeah, two parameters, a width and a height. It can be either the width you're giving in pixels, or it can be something like a display height or a display width. The second thing is uh, the fill. Fill is like you're filling something, the image color or something. And third is no loop. No loop is very important because it's going to help you stop the loop when you're running the draw function. 
Then we have stroke. Stroke is whenever you draw something, there's an outer border over here. That's a stroke. You can change the color. You can like change the width by stroke, weight, and everything. There's background, which is used to change the background, begin shape, and end shape. Suppose you want to create a square. Without using the square function, you're going to open the begin shape function. You're going to use a vertex from this place to that position, from that to that, like the total you have, must have used in Python when you were young. It's the same thing. And yeah, that's it. So there is a function. This uh, OK, so the output of this function is something like this. It's more like a gradient fill, but it's like you have the first outer circle. Then as soon as you progress, you are just decreasing the width of the, the radius of the circle and changing the, and the fill of the, the, the color of the background. So you're going up, you're filling from, it's from zero. So we're going from zero, zero is for blue, black, and 255 is for the white fill. So as soon as you go, you're going from zero to 255. And the same for the radius, you're going from some x width, and you're lowering down to zero. And as soon as we reach the zero value, you just use the no loop function, and the process stopped. The second thing is this. So this is like, this is a canvas. There's a line drawn whenever it works on your mouse. So if there's a mouse cursor over there, so it will create a new line, and it will create more and more line as you go through the mouse. And this is, again, using the randomized function. Each line will have a random color. You don't know what that will be. Each line will be have a random length, and this will this is like I merely a seven line of code. So like creating such pieces is really easy. So as we progress, this like this will increase the difficulty of creating these art form will increase. The this is like you're adding some squares. You're making a grid system, but that is random. You don't know where the points of the grid will be, and you're adding a square or a circle with a random color over there. And how we do it, like you create a set of function, and set up you just initialize your size, your background. And on the draw function, you have your a loop, which goes from 0 to whatever you want to take it. Say I have 100, OK. I have 100 pieces of squares and uh, circles here. So the other art piece is this. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking a canvas for a rectangle shape. I'm adding black lines. And these black lines has an opacity from somewhere from 0 to 100. And all of these are random. Some has a stroke of maybe 0, maybe some 1, 10, anything. Uh, it's a little difficult for you to like see this and understand what I'm saying here. Then comes our algorithms and geometry. So there's a very simple example I've shown here. It's a normal fractal. So how it's going to work, it's like it takes a circle. And if I'm going to towards the right-hand side, it's going to make a circle which is half the radius. And next, another circle, which is half the radius of the second circle. And it goes on till the radius is 0. And I have done in three ways, upper ways, left and right. Sorry, bottom, left, and right. So this will give you something like this. And this is a fractal tree. So this has been shown in the processing documentation by Daniel Schiffman. And if you want to know more about Daniel Schiffman, you can just watch his YouTube channel. That's a coding train on YouTube. And this shows how algorithms are used to make fractals. OK. So we have seen examples on using maths, using algorithms, using geometry. Let's combine these and create something like this. So what is it? Any guess? Actually, it's nothing. It's like something random. So uh, I have a canvas. I point some dots over here. I made a proper grid, which is not random. And at each point, I put a square with a random color. That's it. 
So you can see the code again. So this uses, I think I should focus on the other one instead of explaining the code. So this is a Perlin noise. So what Perlin noise is, you must have seen a distribution. Uh, suppose you have a random distribution and the points might be like this, 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 and you don't know, it's, it, it's random. So if you see the curve of this random distribution, it will be something like this, 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 this. But when there's a noise, the noise distribution, which it's more smooth and more continuous, which will give you something like this. So this is a great example by Emily Z. And what I'm doing here is I'm just taking a, um, making a uh, point, the center point of this thing with the height and with respective to the height and width. Then I'm drawing a circle and I'm adding the radius and the cos and sine value. So the cos and sine value, I'm again using the trigonometric functions here. So what it's doing, it's like it's randomly, so the sign, you know the sine and cos value will give you minus one to one. So it's either going to go, go down or go up. So that's what it's happening. So it's like you're making a Perlin noise and each time it's making another noise and it's storing the previous value and as soon as it goes, comes down, comes closer, and the value is zero, the loop stops and you get a Perlin noise flower. The third thing is it again uses sine, cosine, tan, and all other trigonometric functions. It's like sine waves, the cos wave, cosine waves. If you see them, this is a better example of that. You see the waves going like this. And this again uses the sine function, the sine waves and the cosine waves. And the last thing, the last artwork for today was this one. So it's more like an thing, you can say. So what is happening here is on the left hand side, you can see a white screen with some rectangles, like horizontal lines. And on the right side, we have a, a darker background with lines with a random feature, like you don't know how these lines are going, so I'm, I randomly initialize these lines from like the i value and the j value goes like two, four, anything in between five. On the bottom, we have the semicircles. These are not random. On the bottom part, we have small rectangles, and I just fill the color from the top to bottom with respect of the j value, the loop I'm taking here, like I'm looping all of these values, the rectangle values, and I'm adding the fill of the gth, the ith value, and multiplying it by some factor. Here I'm multiplying it by 0 0.9. And on the background, you can see some like weird patterns, something very messed up or something like that. So it's nothing, it's like you have more than 10,000 random ellipses, ellipses like circles in different forms, and that has a little darker background, and on the left hand side you have this font AFPY. Okay, so how to get started, like if you want to start working with generative art, so how you want to start. So the best way is like you can start working on processing. If you, because processing has now a Python mode, you can even add shaders and we use WebGL. You can use PyKyro. So it is like a Python extension for the Cairo graphics library. Or uh, if you're ex like the ultimate beginner, you can use Sturgill for creating some very aesthetic art forms. Or if you are from a different background, say you are a C++ programmer, you can use the open frameworks. And open frameworks is, is like advanced thing, it's gonna create something, not just images, it's gonna manipulate image, voice, the audio, it's can manipulate the videos and everything. And you can use Cinder, which is more specifically targeted to audios and videos. All right, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, generative art means you are creating something randomly. Because if you're not creating something randomly, it's more like a digital art. Like the digitally you are creating a painting or something like that. Sorry? Yeah. Could you uh, repeat the question to the max 
Okay, so his question is like, all of these examples was using randomness. Why so? So the answer is, if there is no randomness, then it's not a generative art. You're not using the proper use of an autonomous body because if you are like giving the instructions to do this, then it's not a generative art. It's more like a digital art or a media art. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll share all the code on GitHub and I'll ask one of the organizers to like send out the link and you can like just install processing. Like you will get the instruction. I'll, I'll also add the instruction to install processing in the systems. And yeah, that's it. You have just had to run the code and you get, get these art forms. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so if you want to work with 3D, so you're going to work with something like WebGL or shaders. So Python, in these libraries, shaders are not that well established right now. So if you're coming from a JavaScript background, you can use WebGL, you can use the libraries like 3JS and all, and even you can work on the plain vanilla JS and add the shaders and WebGL into it. Uh, if you want, I can even share some artwork code with that as well for the 3D libraries. Any other questions? I think that's it. Thank you.